Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on what time you're watching this. <laughs> uh, I pray you all have had a fantastic week. Uh, looks like the sun has been out more. <laughs> Not that it hasn't been out during the winter, but it's actually warm now. We've had plus degree weathers, which means things are melting. It's great because my driveway, which is like, you know, this sheet of thick ice is slowly, you know, it's not a speed bump to get into my driveway anymore. Uh, so it's nice. Hope you're, you're all having a fantastic week. Um, things continue to go well in our district with COVID. I think uh, as of today, we only have two active cases. So I'm hoping we get to go back to green. It doesn't mean we have to be any less safe, right? But it means that there's a sigh of relief, if you will. <laughs> so thank God for that. Uh, otherwise, just some quick announcements for you before we begin. Um, we are doing communion on uh, Easter. So I guess that's part of the reason why I'm excited, <laughs> right? We do get to do communion. We have been able to order the individually uh, packaged uh, like wafer and grape juice. Um, and so just to give you a bit of a heads up for people who enjoy uh, service from the parking lot, because we do transmit uh, for drive-in drive -in church. Um, I love that. I love that we can do that. <clears throat> I will be bringing out individual, you know, uh, packages for each person uh, outside to you. Uh, I'll be the only one handling those and I'll make sure to, you know, uh, disinfect my hands, be wearing a mask when I bring those to you. Um, outside of that, for the people who are inside and choose to do uh, church inside the sanctuary, as you walk into the building and go through your screening process, uh, they will be like on a cookie tray and you, you can take the one for yourself as you walk in. They will not be distributed uh, during service. We're trying to limit as much contact as possible. Um, <clears throat> try and be safe as possible. So you, you'll pick them up on the way in. The welcome committee <laughs> will help you along with that in case you forget. Uh, so super excited to do communion for Easter. Otherwise, next week is Palm Sunday. Looking forward to preaching about that. And I think that that covers it. We're about to, well, I guess this is the last sermon as we wrap up spiritual gifts and the gift of uh, giving. Um, I am really proud to say that as I have gotten a lot of results of people, that giving is a lot of people's high point. Um, and I'm proud, I'm proud of that, that, you know, our people give so faithfully and it, it's a blessing. It, it's truly beautiful. Um, otherwise, uh, other announcement is that we continue to do small groups, 730 Thursday nights. Uh, it is fantastic. I mean, I look, I'm kind of on the sidelines on this one as my wife is running it. Uh, Megan is, uh, but I know she works like she thinks about it all week long. She prays about it. She comes up with games or a different experience to start breaking the ice and helping uh, a true connection between people, right? Everyone is kind of like eggs in a carton. Everyone's in, inside of their own little shell. And even though they're in a carton, they're not really together just yet, right? Uh, we're, we're trying to break you all open, mix you together <laughs> um, so you guys can better support and encourage and love on each other. And so uh, if you want to be a part of that, seven Thursday. 7.30 Thursday night, uh, you can come here in the foyer of the church and uh, and have fun and get to know people and feel connected. Anyway, otherwise, uh, for prayer, uh, I just wanted to emphasize this week about our frontline workers, people who, uh, who whether they're in uh, retirement homes or <clears throat> end-of-life term care homes or in the hospitals or we have people who are out there pouring in their hearts pouring in their time and energy and uh, putting themselves at risk every single day for what I would argue underpaid <laughs> um, and, and they're out there doing all this and so I just feel like we need to continue to keep those people up in prayer people who give of themselves over and over every single day and serve the people around them and then not just them but also the residents people who may be in complete seclusion uh, for long periods of time feeling completely alone like no one cares that you know that takes a toll on you after a while uh, so if we can keep them in prayer um, I think that's that's very important okay so I'm gonna open up well, in prayer, and then we'll we'll begin for this week. Father God, thank you, thank you for the privilege of being here today, God, of, of being able to share with people, um, share a bit of experience, a bit of life, a bit of learning, a bit of wisdom, um, with with family, God. Thank you so much for that opportunity, Lord. Will you prepare my lips, <laughs> prepare my heart, prepare my mind? 
um, to speak, speak with wisdom, um, and pray that you speak through me, God, your lessons, uh, the things you need for us to learn, God, in order to grow, grow in stature and wisdom and strength, as it says, as it says Jesus did, <laughs> as you did, God, when you were here on earth and you began to grow. Help us to grow spiritually mature. God, speak through me into the hearts of your people. Otherwise, Lord, will you please Please continue to protect, watch over, bless uh, the people who are out there serving, putting themselves at risk during this time, God serving. And will you please comfort um, the people who are feeling very alone, very secluded, and feeling like no one cares. God, will you be there and, and just protect their minds, protect their hearts, and comfort them and let them know you are there, God. Will you inspire us to call people on random and, and try to reach out and encourage each other? In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So uh, we talked about uh, tithing last week, so I'll give a little bit of a summary. Uh, this week we're talking about multiplying. Uh, it's all based on Robert Morris's book, The Blessed Life. Uh, so I take no credit in this. <laughs> Um, he did a fantastic job and it's been something that was placed on my heart many, many years ago that I've continued to live by and I'm glad I learned it. And I just wanted to share that, that journey, that story, uh, all with you. Uh, so last week we talked about how tithe in the Bible literally means 10%. Like that, that's, it's the number. It's, it's just picture if it didn't say tithe, it just said 10%. <laughs> you must give 10%. Like it's just like it's meaning. Uh, we talked about last week about how all of what you make belongs to God, but he asks you to give back 10%. And we talked about, um, you know, leaving for a, an extended period of time and being able to say, hey, I'm going to give you $1,000 each month if you can take a uh, hundred of that and take care of my wife while I'm gone. And then we saw that Jesus in that story is gone from the church and he asks us to take care of his bride, which is the church. Uh, and so, but we give back to God, okay? So that the rest can be blessed, but that if we withhold from God, it's flat out stealing and robbing from God. And then we end up cursed. And we really took a look at that. Uh, we learned that it's important that uh, when we tithe, we give of the first fruits, not the last fruits, the middle fruits, the side fruits, the extra deal fruits, <laughs> but the very first fruits in an act of faith that God is going to provide the rest and how important it is. And we learned that God dared us. I love this one where God's like, I dare you. Test me in this. Test me in this and watch if I don't open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out blessings so much that you don't have enough room to store it all in right? And so that we can actually test God with our finances. Uh, it is it is one way, and he guarantees it, and I believe the Bible. So by all means, if you feel like you need to test God in this one, have fun. <laughs> Keep a journal and, and share your testimonies. Uh, then we learned, and, and this is like the highlight of last week, okay, is that God doesn't need our money, but we need his blessing, and that is incredibly important. And though I didn't really delve into it much last week, um, the idea that you can't outgive God. Uh, the idea that if, if you're going to test God, it's like try to give more than God is going to bless you with. And watch if God doesn't just continue to bless you and bless you and bless you and bless you. You'll find in life that if, if you try to outgive God, <laughs> it'll never happen. Uh, but it's one cool way of trying to test God. So this week we were talking about some different principles. We're talking about multiplying, because who doesn't like to have their finances multiplied, right? Um, but there are some principles and rules that go with multiplication. And so the first is that it, before finances can be multiplied, it needs to be blessed, right? So we talked about that last week with tithe. As we said, you know, when we give back to God what belongs to him, the rest of what we have uh, that he has given us, that we are stewards of, ends up being blessed. Okay, so of the blessed finances that we have, only what is given away can multiply. Those are two very important principles. Um, and, and it's interesting because it, it's really difficult trying to teach people that the more you give something away, the more of it that you end up having. Um, and one of my favorite ways of really explaining that one is with love. Because that doesn't make much sense there either, but you, you think that... Uh, like a child who's like, you know, I, I was put on this planet and, you know, I, I demand love from my, my parents. My parents should love me. They, they create like we're part of that process of creation here. It's God who created. But, you know, they were part of the process and they should love me. And, 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 and so you can grow up like wanting, truly wanting, desiring to be loved. But the more you hold on to it, 
the more you crave it for yourself, because I, I want this, I need this, the more it seems to slip right through your fingers. But in fact, when you are the one who, instead of just wanting love, choose to give love to others, right? Unconditionally, without expecting anything in return, but choose to begin to love other people, this crazy thing begins to happen where it multiplies. Not only does it begin to multiply inside of you and love begins to grow and outpour, and, and but it also begins to multiply in other people. As you give it to them, they start giving it to other people and, and love just continues to grow. And so I, I know in many ways, it's like, that doesn't, that's hard to wrap my head around that the more I give something away, the more of it I seem to have. <laughs> but with finances, it's actually the same thing. So only what is blessed, <laughs> it must be blessed before it can multiply. And only what is given away can multiply. Okay. So I'm going to paraphrase the feeding of the 5,000. Uh, you can find this in Matthew chapter 14, slightly, I didn't put down the verse, but slightly in the middle there, not right at the beginning, and Luke chapter 9. It's kind of the same story. There's little tidbits of both that I am drawing from as you hear me paraphrase and have fun with the story. Uh, I like being a storyteller, <laughs> so I like my paraphrase, but please read the original as I do it no justice. God's word is like absolute and the best and way, way better than I could ever do. So please read the originals found in Matthew chapter 14, Luke chapter 9. But let, let's have fun with this, okay? <clears throat> so Jesus finds out that John the Baptist passed away in un very unfortunate circumstances. And he wants to be alone. I can't blame him. He wants to grieve a little bit. So he pulls away from the crowds and he goes to a, it says remote area. Okay. So he goes to a remote, remote area to be alone, but the crowds find out where he's going and you know, that, that he's there and they come charging after him. And God just, Jesus has this huge compassion in his heart and just begins to heal people. Okay. And then he begins to preach and to teach. So if you can picture nine o'clock in the morning, eight o'clock, you know, whenever the crowds arrive and Jesus begins to preach and to teach people and people are just sitting there and the crowds continue to gather and it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and he keeps teaching, you know, 11, 12 o'clock rolls by and, and there's no break. God just, Jesus just keeps on going right? And, and, you know, one, two, three, four o'clock rolls by. He says late afternoon, right? Okay. So four o'clock rolls by. And then I could picture the disciples who are kind of behind Jesus. I picture behind Jesus while Jesus is speaking to the crowds and they're, they're all intent on listening. But I, I can just picture, um, it's really funny because it happens in animation all the time in anime uh, where there's a character and, you know, they're asked, you know, how are you doing? And their tummy goes, rah, 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 rah. I'm fine. Are you hungry? No. <laughs> and their tummy makes all kinds of grumbling and it gives away their true feelings. So it, it's really kind of funny. <laughs> so I'm being distracted by the phone here. It's ringing in the other room. Anyway, um, so I can imagine the disciples that they're, they're going to Peter and they're like, Peter, listen, uh, it's getting four o'clock. It's getting later in the afternoon. And, you know, the people are hungry. <laughs> they, they, we brought them to a very remote place. There's nowhere for them to get food, nowhere for them to get lodging. And we're, we've been going at this all day. Uh, can you, you know, let Jesus know, can you, you go, you be our, our main guy who goes up to, to Jesus. Can you, <laughs> can you let him know that maybe it's time that we release the people so that they can go and get some food and get shelter for the evening? Uh, of course they, they swindle Peter into this one and, uh, Peter, you know, I could picture him going and going, Psst, Jesus, <laughs> right? Jesus, can can I bug you for a second? You know, in, in between parables or stories or, <laughs> right? Just kind of in between there and it's like, all right, Jesus, yeah, yeah, what's up? Um, You know, uh, it's late in the day, you know, and, and I just picture Peter's tummy going, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> you know, and, and these people, other people are, are hungry and they need a place to stay. Um, maybe it's, it's time we wrap this up, you know, maybe send them home. And, and, and Jesus says something that's a bit like, anyway, he says, well, why don't you feed them? <laughs> so Peter goes back to the other disciples. So, so can we, can we start heading to McDonald's? <laughs> we want to beat the rush. We want to beat the lines, right? Are, are, are we going or what? And, and Peter's like, well, <laughs> actually, um, he, he said we should feed them. What do you mean we should feed them? So should we go into town and somehow find enough like finances and food to feed all these people? That's a lot of people out there. 
<coughs> and it's like, well, I, I don't think he meant for us to go shopping. You know, what do we got? And, and so they take stock of what they got. They ask around and it's like, all right, well, we pool together everything that we have. And we have two chicken nuggets and we have five of those red lobster cheddar biscuits. I don't know who would give those up. Those are delicious. <laughs> but this, this is all we got. So, you know, Peter goes, goes back to Jesus and he's like, uh, you know, Jesus, psst, hey, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> uh, this, this is all, this is all we got. You know, we got these five pieces of bread and two chicken nuggets, right? Uh, should we send them home now? Like, what do we do? And Jesus responds and he says, so I want you to go and break up because you're going to go out and feed the people now. And you got to imagine Peter and all this and the other disciples that, you know, are now really listening in and they're all like, so we're going to feed all of them. I don't know if they took number count at that point in time. And they're just looking out at a gigantic crowd. Uh, we know when we read it says 5,000. So, uh, and it says 5,000 men. We don't know about women and children, but there's this gigantic crowd. Okay. And they're like, uh, sure. <laughs> and so they go out and they begin to make groups of 50 as Jesus instructed them. Now, when I read that, I can't help but think that that's a miracle in and of itself. Uh, I don't know if there's other pastors reviewing this or watching this, or if you've ever been in a church with people and you say, hey, everyone, I need you to break into groups of three and and, and you give them five, 10 minutes, you know, to, to, to begin to do that. And then you look out in the crowd and there's like one group of 17 and then like eight groups of one, uh, maybe one or two groups of three. And it's like, yeah, I, you guys need to break into groups three. That that was the instructions, right? Um, it, it doesn't usually work out super well. And so can you picture the disciples going out with 5,000? That's about 400 groups, guys. More because, sorry, I, I'm picturing in my mind that there's also children and there's also women there. And so when I picture the number, I don't picture 5,000 people. I picture closer to like 20,000 people. And so that's like 400 groups of 50. That's a miracle in and of itself, trying to gather that many people, but they pull it off and they come back to Jesus. And it's like, all right, what, what do we do now? <laughs> Jesus, this is all the food we got. <laughs> you really, we just did all this work. Uh, how are we pulling this off? And so I want you to take note here. Okay. Jesus takes the food and he looks up to heaven. That's where his dad is, right? Come on. He looks up to heaven. And he gives thanks for the food and he blesses the food. Okay, remember, part one of having things multiply is that what you have needs to be blessed, right? So you give to God, you give back to God first so that the rest of what you have is blessed. So Jesus blesses what they have first because it's only something that is blessed that can multiply. Don't forget, that was principle number one, okay? But then this strange dynamic begins to take place. It says that Jesus breaks it. And he hands it to the disciples. And, and so can you imagine half a cheddar red lobster loaf there, a little piece of bread? They're only like this big. <laughs> Broken, given. And, and they're like, with this little half piece of bread, you, I'm going to expect to go feed all those people. <laughs> go and feed them, right? And, and so they're like, well, okay. But they do what Jesus did. Jesus breaks and gives away breaks and gives away. And it says that he continued to do that, to give to the disciples. And then the disciples go out and they begin to feed everyone in the same manner. If you can picture that they have this bread and they break it and give it away, and then they go back to break it and give it away. And then they go back to break it and give it away. And it just continues to multiply. And, it, and when you read it, it says that all the people were fed, about 5,000 men, and there were women and children as well. All those people were fed until they were full, until they were satisfied. Right? So everyone had chicken nuggets and bread. <laughs> you, you can giggle at my, my silliness. It's, it's okay. Okay? And now I want you to think for a moment, where did the miracle happen? Right? Because it, it's easy to sit and say, yeah, okay, Jesus blessed it, broke it, gave it to the disciples. Is, is that the moment of the miracle? Because he kept giving to the disciples what, what he had. Uh, and, and I'm like, you know what? I think the true miracle began when the disciples began to break and give away, break and give away, break and give away. And they just kept doing it. And so it's pretty crazy that like the miracle happened in the hands of the disciples. Blessed by God in the hands of the disciples, the more they gave away, the more that they seemed to have. And then what's crazy is when you read, uh, when you read the two, 
And it's important to notice a little bit of difference. One just says that there were leftovers, right? Uh, but there, when you read Matthew 14, and so I'm going to read a little chunk of it here, okay? Uh, I, I want to just pay some very close attention here, okay? Listen, bring, bring them here to me, he said. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up to heaven, he gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to his disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls. See, now, when I originally tried to picture this in my head, and I pictured, okay, so he's got 12 basketfuls. And I was thinking of whole loaves, right? Like, like maybe they had a basket, and the loaf was placed inside, and they reached in, and they grabbed out and handed, and reached in, and grabbed out and handed, and reached in, and grabbed... You get my point? Uh, but that's not really right. They broke and gave away, broke and gave away. And so it says here, and the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Not whole pieces, things that cost a little bit of self-sacrifice. Because if you can picture Jesus handing to the disciples, they're like, is this for me? Is this what I'm eating? <laughs> this is my, I don't even want to give this away. I'm hungry. I haven't eaten since you started preaching early this morning. We're in the middle of nowhere. There is no McDonald's near here. I need to head to McDonald's and get in line before everyone else. And I want my food. And then Jesus finally hands them their food. And they're just like, you expect me to give this away now? <laughs> you see how many people there are? They're not all going to get fed. We should send them home, right? But they began to break and give away of what they had, of what was blessed by God. And, and it continued to get multiplied, even to the point that at the end, after everyone was full, they brought back baskets full of broken food, of broken pieces. Okay, so again, I'm going to reiterate this like a million times today. What you have needs to be blessed by God. You do that by giving back. Then what you give away gets multiplied. It's only the more that you give away, <laughs> you're giving up of yourself, sacrificing, whatever you want to call it, that you're saying this doesn't belong to me. I'm a good steward of God. I owe nothing. It's all given to me by God. And as a good steward, I am choosing to bless God other people. And then that is when it begins to multiply. And there is something incredibly beautiful about that. Okay. So let's jump ahead in Matthew a little bit. So we were at Matthew 14, feeding 5,000. Now we're jumping uh, Matthew 25. Uh, and I'm starting in verse 22. The servant, and this is when the, the guy who gives money away and says, you know, go take care of it while I'm gone. Okay. And, and then he comes back and says, so what'd you do with the money I gave you? And so uh, the servant who had received two bags of silver, verse 22, came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest. I've earned two more. Woohoo! The master said, well done, my good and faithful servant. Wow. That's high praise. That is high praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. That pops up in Revelations, just so you know. Uh, when you have done what God has asked you to do, right? Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling the small amount. Uh, two bags of silver is actually quite a bit of money. <laughs> you have been faithful in handling this small amount. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Now, some people are like, oh man, I don't want more responsibilities. That two bags made me nervous enough. <laughs> but it, it talks about this joy right? Now I'll give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. We're in this together. Then the servant with only one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew that you were a harsh man, that you harvest crops that you didn't plant, and you gather crops that you didn't cultivate. I was afraid that I would lose your money. So I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. And how, what is the response? But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. I mean, come on, at the very least, you could put it in the bank and gain some kind of interest, right? He did nothing. He was so afraid, oh, what if this gets lost, right? That the blessing that God gave him, he held and therefore did not multiply. He held on to it and it just sat there stagnant and God looks at it back, right? And uh, he looks at the first servant who invested it and it produced, it doubled in size and is good, my good and faithful servant. Then he goes to the second person, right? And he's like, you wicked and lazy servant. 
right? And then what do you think he's going to do? Well, obviously, he's going to take the money away from him and give it to the guy who had it multiplied, right? But the more you try, the more you try and hold on to things, like I said, the more it disappears. The more you give of what God has given to you, the more it multiplies. And we'll look uh, more into that in, in a moment, okay? Um, but just take note that it flat out says, you wicked and lazy, right? You did nothing with it. I gave you responsibility. I made you a steward of what I have handed to you, and you did nothing with it? Nothing at all. You see, again, like I've been talking about, it's all about your perspective on things. If you think you've earned that money and it belongs to you, then I can do whatever I want with it. It's mine, right? But if you look at it as God has given you everything and you are a steward of what he has given you, then at that point, it's like, wow, why did God give this to me? What does God require me to do with this? How do I honor God with what was given to me? Right? And, and so those first two guys, when you read the story, there's three. But anyways, those first two people who invested what God had given them, who, who looked to try to multiply what God had given them to, so to bring some kind of a return, my good and faithful servant. To the one who did not, lazy bum, you lazy and wicked. All you did was hold it and be selfish for yourself. All you did was bury it somewhere and did nothing with it. Remember where I'm going back to Malachi chapter 3 here, and we read this last week. Now return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of heaven's armies. And you ask, well, how can we re return when we've never even gone away? Should people cheat God? Yet you have cheated me. And in some translations it says robbed. Last week we read robbed. But you ask, well, what do you mean? When did we ever cheat you? You have cheated me of tithes and offerings. And that's something I wanted to highlight here. Do to me. Well, I'll finish reading. You are under a curse for your whole nation has been cheating me, right? But it says tithes and offerings due to me. Oh, that's interesting. Because not only is God asking of you to give back what he has given to you and only that, that 10% to take care of his bride while he's gone, but he has made an investment with what's left in you, in you. And it's like, well, what are you going to do with it now? right? And it says that there are offerings that are due as well, right? That tithing isn't the only aspect that's actually important, but that we should look for like what to do with what God has given us, that we're stewards of what he has given us. And it's very important what we do with what is left, okay? And that we should be, and we'll, we'll talk about it in a moment. So let's go back on to this, okay? God may want to bless someone. Did you ever look at it that way? Through you. Okay? Uh, because, I don't know, I go to the convenience store, uh, buy my favorite chocolate bar, <laughs> or a sponge because, you know, uh, I needed one to clean the dishes, <laughs> or for whatever reason. Go to the convenience store, and while I'm there, there, there's this, like, massive lineup at the gambling station all the time. Uh, you know, I'm going to win it big. Come on, God, bless me. Let me win it big. And, and, and I'm just like, yeah, I don't think it really works like that. You see, I think God has put me in charge of the finances that he gives to me. And part of that charge is that since I'm in love with God and therefore in love with what he's in love with, and since he's in love with other people, that part of what he's given to me is actually for someone else. That it's actually my job to be looking for opportunities and ways to bless other people. It's a lot cooler when you can go up to someone and just be like, you know, I've been praying to God and I feel like God has asked me to give this to you. So I'm just being obedient. <laughs> Here you go. What you do with that is up to you. <laughs> it's yours now. It's no longer mine. I've done what God has asked me to do. Responsibility fulfilled, <laughs> right? Um, <laughs> and you give it up. And can you imagine being the person who's receiving, who's like, you know, God, I, I prayed I won the lottery, right? You know, I, I really needed some kind of provision in this way. And, and now here comes this person who believes that God has guided them to help me. So my prayer to you, God, is being answered from this other person who's being obedient, right? And it's a lot cooler when you believe, like you see that God is at work in your life rather than being like, come on, God, help me win the lottery. Oh, look, I won. <laughs> then you don't usually, I, I I haven't met anyone who attributes it to God, um, right? And, and so it's when it comes from someone. So 
all of a sudden now, what he has given to me, or what's left over anyway, because it's, it's all given to me, right? And I give back so that it's blessed. But of what I have, if it's not mine, then what am I to do with it? Yes, some of it will be used for provision to provide for me and my family and, and pay some bills and stuff. But also, he's putting me in charge of helping the people around me, right? So did you ever think that maybe God wants to use you to bless someone else? Oh, it's great when you receive the blessing, but let me tell you, it's even better when you go out and bless other people. You're like, here, this is for you. God bless you, you know? Uh, and, and so again, as you give of offerings, that's above and beyond giving. That, like tithe is giving back to God what belongs to him. Offerings is offering a bit of yourself. It's offering a bit of what you thought belonged to you anyways. And <laughs> it's like, let, let, actually, it doesn't belong to me. Apparently, this belongs to you. God put me in charge of it, and, and he wants me to take care of you with it, right? And that is what begins to multiply. When you give away, when you break of yourself just a little bit, right? Break away this holding on, this want. No, 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 it's not mine. It belongs to God. I am a steward of it. I'm removing this from myself. I'm giving it away. And then all of a sudden, it, it multiplies. It's crazy. Did you know that there is a spirit that can be associated with money. Spirit has, like money, has a spirit on it, okay? Let, let me unpack that for you a little bit. Okay. Ooh, I really jumped up ahead here. I went too far, sorry. Okay, uh, Matthew 6, uh, 24. Uh, and I've done kind of two translations here to help you begin to, you know, maybe see and understand what it says. Um, the first one says this, no one can serve two masters. So this is Matthew chapter six, verse 24. No one can serve two masters for you will hate one and love the other. You'll be devoted to one and despise the other. And it says you cannot serve both God and money. In the King's James Version, it uses a different word here, and I want you to pay attention to it, okay? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and, check this out, it says mamon. Not sure if I'm pronouncing that right, but it says mamon. And, and so when you're reading that, and you're just kind of like, well, that's an interesting difference. What does mamon mean? Is it just the root word for money? Like, how does that work? And so it's really cool because you jump over to Wikipedia and you type in mammon, right? And, and this is what it says. Mammon in the New Testament of the Bible is commonly thought to mean money, material wealth, or any entity that promises wealth and is associated with the greedy pursuit of gain. The Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke both quote Jesus using the word in a phrase often rendered in English as, you cannot serve both God and Mammon. In the Middle Ages, it was often personified and sometimes included in the seven princes of hell. Mammon in Hebrew means money. The word was adopted to modern Hebrew to mean wealth. And it's really interesting because the picture that it shows there is, is of this like guy with a crown and he's got these bags of money in his hand and he's like holding on to this and his eyes are kind of shifting. He's holding on. And, and that is the spirit of Mammon right there. It is the pursuit of gain, of to have. It, it, this is mine. I have earned this. I have gained this. This belongs to me. I have accumulated mine. My goodness, I think of now Lord of the Rings, you know, my precious, the ring. I want the ring. It's my ring, you know, mine. And it's the, this like this greedy attitude, this it, it's mine. And it talks about the spirit on money that either. OK, and, and this is like just really important here is that there is either a spirit of greed, mine, have, want on it or there's a spirit of God on there because it's been blessed by God. And that is a spirit of, <laughs> uh, here, let me, let me read you verbatim what I wrote down here. In the same way, though, if money is not blessed, then by default, it has the spirit of Mammon on it. You see, riches gives you a bunch of lies, and it tries to take the place of God. It offers, but cannot deliver on many things. Security, happiness. It tells you that if you lived in the right house, in the right neighborhood, with the right car, you will be happy. If you have more money, 
you'd have less relationship troubles. People would actually listen to you. You would have more power. You could do what you want, live how you like, and where you like. The spirit of Mammon is based on selfishness. It works on words like steal and cheat, gain and have, buy and sell, whereas God uses words like give and receive, sow and reap. And so when you look at the spirit of those two things, like like it's like you know I just said, give and receive, sow and reap, right? You are a steward of and you've been blessed by God. And now it's like, how do I share this blessing with the people around me? Whereas the spirit of Mammon says, this is mine, it belongs to me. I must have, I must gain in order to be happy. Uh, and so it talks about like how there's even an entity associated with the word. Um, any entity that helps you to gain and to have. And so you can see how those two things are completely in stark contrast to each other. One is about blessing, being in charge of it, giving away and, and sowing and reaping and planting. And the other one is just accumulation and to have. And, and how there is absolutely no way you can love one and also love the other. They're in contrast. You either end up loving one and hating the other, or you love that one and despise the other. Those, those are the words it uses, right? It's either you're in love with God, and, and it's like God has provided for me, and he has blessed me, and he's asked me to bless the people around me. And so he, I have received this blessing from God, and now I want to give this blessing to other people, or this is mine. I earned it. It belongs to me. If I get more of it, I can finally enjoy happiness in my life. I need more. I must have more. Uh, and then I can accumulate more. And that this more will cause me to have security. It'll cause me to have provision. And the opposite is like, God is my provision. God has blessed me. You can't do both. It's impossible. You either do one or you do the other. There is no in between. Okay. Now, see how important that is? Okay, now on that note, Mammon can try to be religious sometimes, right? It, it's not like, here's the thing. So I don't know if you've ever gone to the, like those meetings. Would you like to make more money? Huh? Let me show you how. Come to this meeting and you could like double your income. And, and then sometimes you're, you're like, yeah, you know, God. And they're like, well, wouldn't it be awesome if you had more income so that you could give more to your church? so that you could give more to other organizations. Wouldn't it be nice to have more money so that you can? Ah, that's the emphasis word, isn't it? So that you can. Not so that, why aren't you allowing God to bless you so you can bless others? No, 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 Why don't you make more so you, you can bless others? Who does the miracle? Who does the blessing? It's not you. It is God through you. So the emphasis, so like you, you can hear how Maman works through, can work through something like that and be like, listen, but if you made more, then you could give more away. You could even give more to your church. And how awesome would that be? And, and the emphasis is on you, what you can do, not what God is doing through you, what God has already begun to do in you. Okay? And, and so it can really start to, I don't know, muddy the waters, if you will. Take something that's black and white and try to make it a nice and gray and be like, no, but look, if you made more money, if only, then you could do so much more good in the world. It's like, no, 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 no. God has blessed me. God has asked me to bless other people. And what's crazy is that when I do, God blesses me even more. You know why? So that I can bless other people even more. <laughs> and it begins this multiplication effect. And then what's crazy is that I don't need to worry about provision anymore and security and home because God takes care of it all. And then he continues to bless me. And then what's crazy is that he not only blesses like me, he blesses the people around me and not only blesses me here on earth, but causes this huge multiplication even in heaven. There's a misquote. That's people love to misquote. Okay. And they say that money is the root of all evil. And I'm like, yeah, you should check your Bible on that one. <laughs> First Timothy chapter six, verse 10, okay, says this. And again, depending on what translation you read, so I'm gonna emphasize certain words here and explain why, okay? So it says, for the love of money is, and I highlighted and underlined a root of 
And that's because, so some translations it says the root of, but then to make up for the word the instead of a, as in one, <laughs> okay, then it says um, of all kinds or of many. So the idea is that the love of money, not money itself, okay, is a one of many. So even if it says the word the, it makes up for it later on when it says all kinds or many kinds of, okay? So it is one path. So the love of many, okay, it is one of many. <laughs> the love of money is one of many, okay? Roots of all kinds of evil, okay? Then as you continue to read, and it says some people, and then it talks about the spirit of Mammon, because it says eager for money. That eagerness, that wanting, that craving. Some translations uses the word craving, okay? Uh, but that eagerness, that want, that I must have, okay? So it says, some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs and some translations as sorrows. So I hope, I'm just gonna read it like verbatim here. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. And so you can see why I started trying to emphasize certain words because the spirit of what it's saying here is that the love of money is one of the roots of all kinds of evil. Not that money is evil, Okay, and not that money is the sole proprietor of evilness, <laughs> okay, but it can cause all kinds of evil. And then it explains it further to say some people who want, who crave, who desire, who, who, who want money have begun to wander from what they believed. Right? Remember how I told you that Maman tries to lie to you. It tells you the more you have, the more secure, the more happy, the better relationships, the more power, the more influence you will have, right? So they have begun to wander from faith. And then it says, and pierced themselves with many sorrows and griefs. Because of their want and craving, it is no longer blessed by God because they've put a different spirit on that money, okay? And by doing that, they have hurt themselves. And so, like I, I, I said, when people come in and they say, you know, Luigi, I have been going through this and this at home and this happened to me and that happened to me. And I ask the question, do you tithe? Right? Because some people eager for money have strayed and they've pierced themselves. When you rob from God and you're under that curse, when you desire to have and want you're put under something completely different and you pierce yourself with many griefs. It hurts you in the long run and you go through all kinds of pain and suffering that you don't need to be doing, but it's all depending on how you're looking at it. <laughs> money is an evil in and of itself. Love of money is a root of many evils and it's all about the spirit that is placed on the money. Because when it's blessed by God, then you better believe that this is a blessing from God uh, to outpour, not just for you, but to the people around you, that that's the way God designed it. And, and that when you do that, that blessing begins to multiply rather than craving and wanting. And, and then that ends up hurting. That ends up being a curse. Luke chapter 16, parable of the shrewd manager. Uh, again, Luke chapter 16. Here we go. Okay. Jesus told this story to his disciples. There was a certain rich man who had a manager handling his affairs. One day, a report came in that said that the manager was wasting his employer's money. So the employer called him in and said, what's this I hear about you? Get your report in order. You're going to get fired. Oh boy. Hot water. <laughs> the manager thought to himself, oh boy, now what? My boss has fired me. I, I don't have the strength to dig ditches, to do hard manual labor out there. I'm way too proud to beg. I'm emphasizing here myself a little bit. Okay, he says, uh, I don't have the strength to dig ditches and I'm, no, I'm too proud to beg. I said way too proud, but anyway. <laughs> you can hear his spirit, right? Oh, what great humility he has. I'm, a, I'm way too proud to beg. I'm not begging, right? And I'm not digging ditches. How else can I get out of this? Ah, uh, I know how to ensure that I'll have plenty of friends who will give me a home when I'm fired. So he invited each person who owed him money, who owed money to his employer, to come and discuss the situation. So he asked the first one, how much do you owe him? 
And the man replied, well, I owe him 800 gallons of olive oil. That's a lot of olive oil. So the manager told him, take the bill, quickly, change it to 400 gallons. And how much do you owe my employer? He asked the next man. Well, I owe him a thousand bushels of wheat, was the reply. Here, the manager said, take the bill, change it to 800 bushels. The rich man had to admire, oh, the wording here, he had to admire, had to admire, and then it says the dishonest rascal <laughs> for being so shrewd. And it is true that the children of this world are more shrewd in dealing with the world around them than are the children of light. So it's interesting, I, like the parable's wrapping up here, right? He's like, so there's this guy and he mishandled his employer's money. And so he was getting fired and he's like, well, what am I going to do so that I, you know, I, I'm not gonna go and do this. I'm not gonna go do that. Now I've got a bad reputation. How am I gonna survive this? I know. I'm gonna cheat, if you will. <laughs> I'm gonna change the accounts so that these people kind of owe me, right? And, and so, and it says that the rich man figured out what he was doing, right? Yeah, and he admired the, <laughs> he admired his shrewdness, okay? And then it says this, that the world around us is more shrewd using their money than we are. They're smarter. They know, uh, you know, how to manipulate it. But then are the children of light. But then here it is. And I've highlighted and underlined and bolded this, the sentence, okay? Because this wraps it up. And if you ignored everything I said up till now, just, just listen to this one, okay? Here's the lesson. This is what it says in the Bible. Verse nine. Here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources to benefit others and make friends. Then, when your earthly possessions are all gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. So, remember, like how I said last week, that uh, what we're trying to store up treasures in, right, it is not here. We're trying to store up treasures in heaven. And so, when you think of the one thing that's eternal, and, and that's people, that's people's souls, that, that's like, you know, who they are. And so it says here, here's the lesson. Use your worldly resources while you're here on this earth. Remember that God's made you steward of. Use what he has given you, your resources, to benefit other people, not yourself. Stop looking to only benefit yourself from it and look to benefit other people. Make friends, it says. And when you think about uh, a friendship, a bond, can you picture for a moment maybe someone who is incredibly struggling with life and you help them to get back up on their feet? Where you gave, you never asked for anything in return, you just helped them to get back up. And as they, you know, begin to take care of themselves again, they look to you and they're like, if you hadn't have been there, I would never have been able to do this. And you begin to bless other people and not just with finances, but with the message of God and who God is. And in their lives begin to be changed because of your generosity or God's generosity through you <laughs> changes their lives that one day when all the stuff on this planet is God, so then when your earthly possessions are gone, they will welcome you to an eternal home. And when they're up there in heaven, they're like, thank you. Thank you because you took what God had given you and you blessed me and you showed me that that blessing came from God and you pointed the way to God. And not only did it provide for me, did God provide for me in that moment, but he also began to prepare for me an eternal home. And now here we are and you're going to spend eternity with us and we welcome you here because you helped us get here. Okay. So when you look at it, generosity has the capabilities. It can be like the grounds for a path of salvation for people. And that's what we're to store, is to store up treasures in heaven so that we're supposed to use the resources that we have here to benefit other people. People who are in need, people who are around us, people going through a tough time and be able to say, God has blessed me and he has asked me to pass on this blessing to you, that maybe you're struggling right now. Maybe you're going through some stuff. So let this blessing pass on to you, but you need to know it comes from God. This isn't me. I'm just trying to be obedient, <laughs> but God is trying to look out and take care of you. That all of a sudden, it's like spirit on that money has been completely changed because now it's being used for God. Okay. So again, I'm repeating myself, but that's okay. Matthew chapter six. Verse 19, don't store up treasures here on earth where moths eat them, rust destroys them, where thieves break in and steal. Store your treasures in heaven 
where moths and rust cannot destroy. Thieves do not break in and steal. Wherever your treasure is, there the desires of your heart will also be. Now add that to the spirit of money, right? If it's all, if your treasure is your finances, right? And to want and to have, that's where the desire of your heart is. But if the desire of your heart is for other people, is to be a blessing onto other people, is to point the way to God, right? Wherever your treasure is. Now all of a sudden your, your heart, uh, the spirit on, on which the finances is on belongs to God, is a blessing by God, right? It begins to change everything. And don't forget that only what is blessed can multiply and only what is given can multiply. All right, so hold on a second. After you bless your money by giving it to God, and after giving it away to bless others, not only do you get eternal treasures and friends, but then it multiplies? That's right. We continue to be focused on, wait, 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 this multiplication, it can happen here? Like, God's going to bless me even more? Yeah, he probably, he said, test me in this. If you bring your tithes and your offerings that are due to me, <laughs> so if you've been diligent, a good steward, right? Watch if I don't open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing on you, you won't have enough room to store it all. Why? Why do you think he'd give you more than you can store? Well, that's a simple solution. <laughs> it's because you're meant to give it away. <laughs> not meant for you to hold on to anyways. It's meant to be given away, right? And then what's crazy is that not only are you blessed and provided for and taken care of in that way, right? But you are now also storing up treasures in heaven. That's way better than, than the blessing you receive now. So not only do you receive now, but God also multiplies the blessing for other people. And that blessing begins to bless other people who bless other people who bless other people. And it can like be the beginning of a change of heart for an entire nation, for the planet. Like, come on. If we were generous, if we saw that what we had didn't belong to us, but was all given by God and that we can use it as a blessing for other people. My goodness, if the world thought that way, no one would ever go hungry. Everyone would be provided for. We would be united and all understand that it's all God's fault. God has provided and taken care of us all. And not only do we get blessed here, but like heavens multiply. And how crazy is that? Mark chapter 4, verse 18. It's cool. You guys who are watching me can hit pause, write it down, look it up, whatever you need to do. It's great. So I'm sorry if I go a little bit quickly. Uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 18. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns. So here's another uh, parable, and it's about sowing seeds. It's about like sowing the good word, if you will. Okay. Um, so still others, and I started with this one, just the verse before the one I really wanted to, just because it proves the point. Anyway, still others, like seed sown among thorns, they hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, ring any bells? <laughs> and the desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Uh I'm like really highlighting the verse that comes after this, but if you just want to pause there for a second, the deceitfulness of wealth, what's he talking about? He's talking about the spirit of Bamont, <laughs> the lies of riches that says, this is what's going to take care of you. This will bring happiness. This will give you influence. And it's the spirit of Bamont and the desires for other things, everything else, not the desire to serve God, not the desire to as God has blessed you to bless the people around you, right? Because of what's in your heart and you crave and want and have the spirit of Mammon, that he's become your master, it, that chokes the word of God out, making it unfruitful. It doesn't take root in you. It doesn't grow. You can't get to know God. You can't grow in maturity. You can't grow close to God with the spirit of Mammon living inside of you. Okay, verse 20. This is really what I wanted to highlight, okay? Others like seed sown on good soil, they hear the word, they accept it, and produce a crop. And then this is what it says. Some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. That's crazy. You're telling me that one seed, you're telling me that one little bit of, of obedience to God and the blessing he's given to me to bless other people, that if I just did a little bit, not only does 
do they get blessed? But that blessing is multiplied 30 times? That's huge. 60 times? That's huger. Oh, silly words, I know. <laughs> huger, bigger, more. And then it says, some a hundred times what was sown. That when you begin to be obedient to God and begin to, to, to bless others the way God has blessed you, and, and it's not you, it's all God through you, but you hear my point, okay? It gets multiplied to a huge degree that not only can it cause a salvation for one person, but it can save an entire town. It can save an entire, like, it just begins to grow and grow and grow, which is nuts because when you go to heaven, and it says, and those people will be like, invest your resources to benefit other people. You go to heaven, and it says, and they're waiting there for you to show you your eternal home, right? They're excited for you. It's like this crowd of people saying, thank you. Thank you for being obedient to God. My life was changed because you were obedient. And here we are, and here's the thing. Not only was my life changed, but I had kids, and I went to school myself, and I began to do this for other people as well. And then my kids grew up in this, and they learned about it, and then they went to school, and they went to work. And, and they began to, to preach to other people. And, and all these people that you have no idea who they even are is part of the multiplication of God. But because you were obedient, their lives were forever changed. And so you have this army of people up in heaven that are just so happy to see you. <laughs> Thank you for being obedient to God. What you have done, that small amount of obedience, was multiplied. And not only through blessing here on earth, but more importantly, through massive, massive blessings for eternity. So not only can God begin to sow generosity in you here and financially bless you, but it changes like the fruit of heaven itself. Everything around you begins to be changed. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, I'm reading in verse 6. So 2 Corinthians Chapter 9, verse 6. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds, they're going to get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. Right? And he's talking about the amount that you're giving. He goes, when you're planting, when you're blessing in, into the kingdom of heaven for other people, you know, God has asked me to bless you and you do it just a little bit, you'll get a little bit back. But the one who plants generously they get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. That's verse 7. Okay? You must decide in your heart. This is between you and God. So I don't care. I have nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay? This is between you and God. You have a conversation with Him. You ask Him, God, you've made me a steward of this. How much and what do you want me to begin to bless other people with? Okay? You must decide what to give. Not anyone else for you. Okay? And then it says, and don't give reluctantly. Don't give in response to pressure. So it's not me sitting here saying, you must give. No, 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 no. <laughs> this, is, this is between you and God. You need his blessing. Right? And don't. Don't respond to pressure. Don't give out of guilt. Because that's the wrong spirit. <laughs> it's pointless then anyways. If you're going to give, give cheerfully. So the, the next part of that verse. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Who wants to be a blessing for other people. Come on. Don't you want to give to the person who's like, this has been a blast. I have so much enjoyed blessing other people. And it has just grown. And I just want to give more away. Like... That's cheerful. That's joyous. Don't you want to give that person more to see what happens? Don't you want to partner with that person and be like, wow, I want to be do what you're doing? Rather than the person's like, uh, fine, he, here you go. That's not any kind of fun. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. And God will generously provide all that you need. Then you will always have everything you need. And in fact, plenty left over to share with other people. As the scriptures say, they share freely and give generously to the poor. Their good deeds will be remembered forever. That's what it says. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, starting in verse 6. It's not me. God loves who, people who give cheerfully, graciously, happily. And then God not like... 
begins to generously provide for them all that they need because they've been so happy to give to other people. And then it says, then you will always have everything that you need. Not everything that you want, (laughs) everything that you need. God takes care of you, all your needs, you're taken care of. And he gives you plenty left over. Why? Because you're not going to take the leftover and be like, ah... I can go buy my ATV, snowmobile, uh, yacht, <laughs> cabin, cottage, canoe. Uh, you know, you're not looking to serve yourself. You understand that God has given me leftover so that now I can go bless even more people. And how exciting is that, right? And God is like happy to be doing that with you. Verse 10, for God is the one who provides seed for the farmer and then bread to eat. Remember, he gives you everything. In the same way, he will provide and increase your resources and then produce a great harvest of generosity in you. I love that part of generosity. The best part of this, the greatest harvest that we receive is the gift of generosity, of being able to give to other people. So he increases our resources. He provides, increases our resources. Why? To continue to grow a heart of wanting to give away. The spirit has been completely changed. Now all I want to do is give away. (laughs) All I want to do is go and bless other people and be like, God is taking care of you. He loves you. People will begin to be changed. Verse 11, yes, you will be enriched in every way. So this isn't just financially. This is emotionally. This is my relationships to all the people around me, the friendships I have that if I'm generous, he enriches me in every way. And then it says, so that you can be, always be generous. So he begins to help me to grow as a person. He helps me to grow in friendships and relationships in all ways. Why? So that I can continue and always in my life be generous. And then, and when you take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. There it is. They're not thanking you because you've been good with it. Been like, this isn't me. God has told me I need to give this to you. So they can't thank you. Well, thank you. No, 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 no. Don't thank me. I'm just the obedient one. God's the one who's providing for you. Thank God. They will thank God. So two good things will result from this ministry of giving. The needs of believers in Jerusalem will be met. And they will joyfully express their thanks to God. 13, as a result of your ministry, they will give glory unto God. So let's summarize here. Being generous causes provision. It needs to be blessed before it can be given. (laughs) And then give of what you got so that it could be multiplied. Give generously, graciously, not under pressure. And not only... Does your stuff get multiplied? But heaven does as well. And so I wanted to close with, well, two things here. I wanted to close with asking the question, so what's the spirit on your money? And then I wanted to teach a little bit about some changes that are happening to us as a church. Okay, so I'll get back to that. What's the spirit on your money? We'll get back to that and we'll close in prayer. Okay, Uh, but I wanted to share some, some of the changes here. Uh, So when I first arrived here, one of the things that I saw was that our missional giving uh, was actually quite low. That I came from a place that actually had a third of the membership that we have here and gave more than than we did here. And so immediately I challenged uh, the church, the board, uh, and said, "We, we can do more than this. We can definitely do more than this. And so they agreed and we began to do more. And then I saw that in our budget, that when we create our budget, there actually isn't a section for the church to give to missions. So I'm not sure how, like, I believe that the way this worked before is that as a church, we wanted to give to missions. And so we asked the congregation uh, at a congregational level to give of tithes and to give of offerings to missions. And I challenged, uh, again, the board and said, "Well, well, hold on. I want as a church to be doing what I expect my people to do. 
And not only that, but I have the same expectations for district, who's above us. As a church, we tithe, so it's great. You guys tithe in your lives. We as a church tithe to district, who takes care of all kinds of churches in Ontario and Canada, around the world, right? And, and so we tithe to them too. And I'm like, well, in the same way that we're asking people to give to missions, shouldn't we also at a church level give to missions? And so I know at the end of the year, when we go to budget, we might be off. A little bit because I believe that we as a church should provide for so if we're talking numbers here we used to give a hundred dollars to uh, two people uh, that we support as a church one in Sierra Leone and that that's Emma and then we have Kathy who's in Honduras and those are two people and I challenge the church and, and we bump that up to like 250 each and so I believe that that should be covered by the church that that should be part of our budget, that we cover that and that we still, and this is the crazy part, maybe I, I am crazy or just incredibly, I want to be faithful to God here, okay? Um, that when you write down the word missions, uh, so the way it used to work is that they expected people to give to missions and that's what tried to fulfill the amount that they promised to those people. And if we didn't fulfill that amount, then the church would cover. I'm saying the church should cover completely. And then anything that says that comes in that says missions should be above and beyond. Because remember when I told the story last week of the three different people who received $1,000 and, and were asked to take 100 of that and take care of my wife while I was gone? How many of you actually were there and be like, whoa, I want to be the person who not just gave 100 every single month, but gave 120, 140, 160, 200 to take care of whenever they were in trouble? Exactly. I want to be that person too. So as a church, I believe that we should make the promise to give that. So it should be part of our budget. And then when you write down to missions, that'll be above and beyond. So that those people who are out there, not only can they depend on, on what we've promised them, but they're actually going to get on occasion even more. So I need you to know, so some of the changes. So when you write down for Emma, that goes directly to Emma. You know, it is designated. You have designated. That's where it goes. That's exactly where it goes. We honor where your, your decision to do that, and it goes directly there, okay? When you write down to missions, we have uh, kind of split it in half. The amount that you've given split in half, 50-50, 50 would go to Emma, and 50 would go to Kathy. And, and so uh, if you had written down something like this amount for Emma and this amount for missions, well, then the amount you wrote for Emma would go directly to Emma, and then... 50% of what you wrote for missions would go to Emma and the other 50% would go to Kathy and that's where it's gone. And so um, that continues. So when you write down missions, we give it 50-50 to the two people that are missionaries that we are supporting, okay? Um, the other thing I'm trying to change is that right now as a church, um, we sponsor missionaries. And that means we give the money. That's it, right? Like we have people we want to invest in and we invest in them. I'd like to change that. You see, there's a big difference in terminology when you say sponsor and when you say relationship, when you say partner, right? I like to see this as people who we are supporting, but that is like a part of us that is out there. Maybe we can't get out there ourselves and be missionaries, but we're supporting with. And so I would like to base what we do out of relationship. And so I'm looking forward to, as you know, COVID subsides, building relationship with our missionaries and understanding the struggles that they go through and making you a part of it so that it's not just, I'm just giving money away, but so that you are building relationship with people. It is my desire in the future of this church to create and plan a missions trip and give the opportunity. I truly believe everyone should have an opportunity in life to go on a missions trip, to see what it's like somewhere else on this planet and serve and love other people and what they're living like and what they go through every day and their incredible faith because you have so much to learn. I have so much to learn. And so I want to begin to plan that and it needs to be planned out of relationship. And so, yeah, uh, some of the changes that, that we're making are to continue as a church. We want to do what you're doing. You are being faithful as a church. We want to be faithful as well. And so we are going to begin to, so it's, it'll be part of our budget. This is what we have promised these people. This is what we will be giving them. And then when you write down, you know, for missions, then that goes above and beyond. It goes even bigger. They'll have even more. And that's super exciting. Now, on top of that, I, I also need you to know uh, that as a church, 
um, we do give lots away. <laughs> um, it's part of what we're supposed to be doing, right? And so uh, there's all kinds of needs that we get throughout the year, uh, like Yemen. Uh, you know, uh, people returning uh, to Jerusalem, to Israel, uh, need some kind of support, so we give there. There's a ministry where uh, there's some places that can only be reached via plane and boat, <laughs> and, and so we uh, give finances to some of those organizations. There are many organizations throughout the year that when we receive that they're asking for help that we give, and we will continue to do that. I just think that we need to be a little bit I don't know, more faithful, more giving, more gracious, more, we need to offer more. Like We're stewards of what God has given us. And I know that this works at a church level too, that when we give and we bless other people, God will continue to bless this church. And not just financially, but begin to bless us, help us to grow in maturity and graciousness and love and in all those things that God will begin to help us to grow in all of the other ways. So I wanted to share with you I guess my vision as we move forward uh, and how I want to continue to bless and, and do even more. On a personal level, I look at myself and, and I wish and I want to and I've begun to take the steps in my own personal life and I'm being a bit vulnerable here, right? That not only will I, I want to tithe, which is that 10%, but I'd like to reach the point where I also offer up 10%. And, and so... In my own family, we've begun making the strides to reach that. And as a church, I'd like to challenge us to be able to, as we move forward, maybe it's like 2% per year, you know, uh, and over the next five years, we'll finally reach the point where we tithe as a church to the district. And then, then we offer up another 10% to give out to missions and to making a difference into the world around us. And of course, that's on top of outreach and on top of other things that we try to do because missions is kind of three categories and I could spend all day teaching about this. So I'm going to try and wrap this up. Um, but uh, it, it's in like your own backyard, in your town that you're in. It also includes the country that you're in, the nation that you're in, maybe the province. And then there's also so I'm like small circle, bigger circle, and then bigger circle, then around the world. And we should be doing something in each of those levels. Anyways, let's backtrack for a moment. I wanted to share that with you. So hopefully you begin to get excited about where we're going. Uh, but I wanted to go back to the question, so what's the spirit on your money? After all this talk, after all this discussion and digging in, um, where is our heart, right? What is the spirit on our money? Will you bow your heads and pray with me? Father God, I thank you for this timely message, Lord. And I pray we begin to analyze what's going on in our hearts and where our treasure is, Lord. That we begin to look at what you have given us, God, and begin to see it as we are in charge of. You have given this to us to be in charge of. And it's very important, the decisions that we make with what you have given us, God. And so, God, will you help us to be aware? And will you help us begin to grow generosity in our hearts, God? May we begin to hold on to you. May we enjoy the blessing that you continue to give us every single day and how beautiful that is, God. And may we begin to share it with the people around us, God. There is so much need in this world. And so may we begin to be obedient to what you have given us. May we be able to invest those two bags of silver, God. <laughs> and begin to make it multiply, Lord. And may it not only multiply here on this earth, but may it multiply in heaven, God. So I know you are the one who multiplies that to an incredible degree when we are faithful and obedient to you. God, grow a gracious heart in us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. God bless you all. I know I'm a bit long today. Thank you for bearing with me. Um, God bless you, protect you in all that you do. Amen. Thank you, guys.